us know who that was? I mean, the actor was Donnie Osmond. Do we know who he was portraying? That was Joseph from Genesis, Old, Old Testament Joseph. And it's from the musical uh, Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dream Coat. And he was in prison. They didn't actually send a choir of children into him in prison so that he would have a backup chorus. Um, but it will become clear as I speak today why I showed you a man wrapped in a diaper. Um, and it was really, actually, a really powerful presentation of Joseph and that being in prison and being trapped. Um, and the title of the sermon is Get Out. And probably not many of us have been in prison, but maybe we have, and maybe we are. And what does that mean? Uh, maybe we make our own prisons. And we might be intimidated if we're around someone who has been in prison, and yet at times in our life we may create our own prison. And when I'm Speaking of prison, I'm talking about being in a place where we have created four walls around us where we cannot get out under our own power. The reason I put these cones up here, this is the size of the average cell. This is six by eight, and it's really interesting that I have a communion table in here and the pulpit because in a six by eight cell, they typically would have a bed, two beds typically, and like a sink and a toilet. Um, so that's about how much space they would have in the cell, this much space to move around in. So what does it mean? And maybe that's a real stretch for you when I say, do we create our own prisons? Do we, as women, create our own prisons where we say, I can't do that? We create these false boundaries and say, I'm a woman, I don't do that. Or as a man, do we say, um, even silly, I'm not, they're not like all earth shattering. Do we say, I don't wear pink, or um, I don't do that kind of job, that's woman's work. Do, I, do we make these boundaries where we say, we can't go outside of this little six by, this little cell that I've created. So I'm saying prison is an enclosure, real or imagined, an enclosure that we put ourselves in. We didn't necessarily build it. We didn't necessarily do anything to get there. Sometimes we did. Uh, we choose sometimes to operate within the confines of this cell. When it comes to the Spirit of God, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Every chain is broken through you, Jesus. Right? That's why we sang that song today. Because even if you are in a real physical prison, there are no chains. There are no walls that will keep you in. I, I have kind of a penchant for pod, 
podcasts, like murder, I know it's really strange. The more I preach to you guys, the stranger you probably think I am. But I like to listen to, and I watch them on TV too. Like, do any of you guys like watch, you know, SBU or those kind of odd things? Um, thank you! Um, I don't know why. I guess because you like to see, because not always when you read the news does the bad guy get it in the end, and so you like, I'm justifying, yes. For you too, okay. Um, you like to see that the bad guy ends up being caught and, you know, there's justice. Boom, boom. <laughs> um, and so I like all of that thing and all that kind of stuff. And so when I started thinking about being in the confines of a cell, my mind just was racing about being a wrongly accused person, being put into a prison and you aren't guilty, and what that would do to you. Um, sometimes there are cold cases and there's a person that might be out running around and he knows he did it. Is he just as much in a prison even though he has no walls around him? Because he lives in this prison without walls thinking that he's going to be. That almost sounds more torturous than being behind those walls, right? And just recently, it's funny that I was working on this sermon and then the, the whole thing with Whitey Bulger, um, if you didn't hear the news, Whitey Bulger was this notorious mobster from Boston. And he was, I wouldn't say he was free, but he was living in California for 16 years, out unbeknownst to anyone, with his wife under an assumed name in California, and they found him. And I thought, those 16 years, he was still in prison because he couldn't let, he, he had no freedom. Well, they found him, put him in prison, and they moved him to this high security prison in Hazleton, West Virginia, and within 24 hours of them moving him, he was found dead with his tongue cut out. Poor Whitey. Yeah. So, it doesn't always turn out well. How many people are convicted of crimes they did not commit? A bunch. But I'll tell you this, last year the Washington Post said 4.1% of defendants who are sentenced to death, I'm not just talking about people who are found guilty of all crimes, sentenced to death, 4.1% in the United States, are later shown to be innocent. One in 25, we might have 25 people, let's say that all y'all are rotten, Killers. One of you completely did not do it and you're still going into prison. That's, that's horrible. So, I just want to say that being in prison is not necessarily a function of being guilty. Nor is this sermon going to be about being guilty. This is going to be talking about being in prison. It's not even going to be talking about punishment and whether this deserves this punishment, this deserves that punishment. It's not about that. It's about being in prison. It's not about criminality. It's not about the state of our criminal system. We all find ourselves in prison. We all find ourselves four walls around us and we don't see a way out. Nowhere to go, maybe no fault of our own, maybe we don't even know how we got there, but we're there. And 
might be a job, it might be a class. I mean, it doesn't have to be huge. It might be a marriage. And I'm, I'm not saying it has to be a horrible marriage. But I'm just saying, what if you feel like I'm stuck and things are not right? How do I fix it? How do I make it move? How do I go this way or that way? It's not doing what it's supposed to be doing. You're in a prison. What do you need to do? Does anyone know the expression, in the weeds? You know the expression, in the weeds. So, if you've ever worked in a restaurant as a waiter or waitress or bartender, this is an expression, in the weeds, is when you're waiting tables and all of a sudden, and this is another expression, you get slammed. That means all of a sudden they see all of your tables and you are in the weeds. In the weeds means, like if you're in a corn maze, you all of a sudden do not know which way is up, you don't know where to go, who to serve, which way to go at all. And so you're just like, and people have to bail you out. That's like being in a prison, when you're in the weeds. So I'm saying that being in a prison, this metaphorical being in a prison doesn't have to be some life-threatening situation. But what is your prison, or prisons, what happens when you're in your prison? What do you do when you get out of your prison? We're gonna look at three people, each learn something different, in their prison and from their experience. But what is the saying? What is the goal in this? Is the thing that is similar, the thread that happens in all three of those. And the first one is Joseph. And that is the scene that we just saw. So we probably know the story of Joseph. Jacob had all the all these sons, you know, Jacob, Jacob and sons. If you haven't seen the movie, get it on Netflix or something. Um, it's a great movie. And Jacob loves Joseph more than the others. And all the sons know that. He loves Joseph so much that he makes them this beautiful coat and all the others just kind of wear just their plain robes. And so Joseph also is gifted and bright and all of these wonderful things and handsome and everything. And he kind of makes his own prison, which you will find with all three of these people that we're gonna discuss. If it's not tempered, these people can make their own prison that they're not exactly blameless. And so when Joseph is only 17, he's really pretty precocious and a little braggadocious. And so he goes out to see his brothers and he says, this is from Genesis 37. Now Joseph had a dream, and this is with all of his older brothers, and he told it to his brothers. And it says, and they hated him even more, which means they already hated him. Now we're going to hate him even more. So he said to them, please hear this dream which I have dreamed. There we were, binding sheaves in the field. And behold, my sheep arose and also stood upright. And indeed, your sheep stood all around and bowed down to my sheep. And the brother said to him, Shall you indeed reign over us, or shall you indeed have dominion over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. Your sheaves shall bow down to mine, and dad always liked me best, obviously. That's kind of what he was saying. So they throw him into a pit. So he kind of made his own prison. You know, he kind of asked for it. They left him for dead. But then one of his brother, brothers kind of saves him. He ends up maturing a little, and he is rescued, and he is taken, and 
really, his life starts to turn around until Potiphar's wife seduces him and then lies about her seducing him, and he is put into prison. And this really is through no fault of his own. So, while he is in prison, he becomes a great leader, a great prophet, and people start to seek him out. And I'm not going to go into it in detail, but because of his wisdom, people actually start to seek him out until they finally take him out of the prison. And it says in Genesis, whatever he did, the Lord made it prosper. From inside the prison, he was prospering. Your giftings, here's the, the lesson that we learned from Joseph. Your giftings are not put aside because of your surroundings. When all you have is God and you, your giftings are there. When he was outside, he was kind of a jerk. But when he was in this prison, he just had God and his gift. And he used those. His environment was all about God and his gift. They show up best because that's all he had, right? So then we see Peter. Peter was also kind of braggadocious, kind of hard-headed. Uh, he denied Christ but adamantly said, I will not deny you, then I don't know him, I don't know him, I don't know him, right? That Peter. And he ended up in prison. Acts 12. Peter was therefore kept in prison. 12.5 if you want him to look it up. But constant prayer was offered to God for him by the church. Constant prayer. And when Herod was about to bring him out, that night Peter was sleeping, bound with two chains between two soldiers, and the guards before the door were keeping the prison. Now beheld, behold, an angel of the Lord stood by him, and a light shone in the prison. And he struck Peter on the side and raised him up, saying, Arise quickly. And the chains fell off his hands. Then the angel said to him, Gird yourself and tie on your sandals. And so he did. And he said to him, Put on your garment and follow me. So he went out and followed him, and did not know that what was done by the angel was real, but thought he was seeing a vision. When they were past the first and the second guard post, they came to the iron gate that leads to the city, which opened to them of its own accord. And they went out and went down one street, and immediately the angel departed from him. And when Peter had come to himself, he had done all of this, just moving along. He said, now I know for certain that the Lord has sent his angel and has delivered me. And I talked about this in another context. I talked about this, that the Lord will deliver you, but he still expects you to do your part. He says, stand, stand up, tie on your sandals, tie on your robe. But really, an interesting part here is that Peter was sleeping. And it was the church praying that made all of this happen. The church was sending up constant prayer. People who say, how many of you have heard people say, oh, I'm very spiritual. I believe in God. When you say, why don't you come to church with me? I'm very spiritual. I have a relationship. I believe in God. Well, why don't you come? Well, I don't believe in organized religion. I don't need to be a part of a church. This, 
right here is the best case analysis you will ever need. Peter was asleep in a cell and the church was in constant prayer for him. And an angel came and got him out. If you ever need to tell someone, why do I, because that's a hard thing to contest, isn't it? When someone says, oh, I, I believe in God. We have, I have a very deep connection. I have a great prayer life. I don't need to belong to a church. Oh yeah? When you're in, in a dire situation, do you have a community of people who are going to be praying for you? I have that. Peter had that. I want that, don't you? It was like the atheist that we had staying in our house a couple weeks ago. And I said, he's a police officer. And I said, well, I'm commanded to pray for you. Is, are you okay with that? Oh, yeah, I'm okay with that. Okay, so now you believe this God that doesn't exist. It's okay if I pray to him? Yeah. I mean, I know I wasn't that sassy. I said, well, I'm going to be praying to the God that I believe in. And he's going to be protecting you. Right? So anyway, I got off the subject there. So, Peter was asleep at the wheel. Not that we shouldn't sleep. We all need to sleep. But when we're in our prison, we need that community of believers. And later on, as Peter matured even more, he goes on to exhort whole communities of believers. He talks about how the elders should behave, how the elders should gather believers together, because he saw how they gathered together and held him up. Peter had benefited from the flock that lifted him up and saw the value when he was in prison. Even in prison, you're not alone. God is more aware of your plight and better able to pluck you up, pluck you out of your prison when you're in prison than when you're out there so distracted with everything that's going on. I don't know if that makes sense, but Paul, Paul and Silas were in prison. Acts 16, 16. Now it happened, as he went to prayer, that a certain slave girl, possessed with the spirit of divination, Metis, who brought her master such profit by fortune telling, but Paul, greatly annoyed, turned and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out that very hour. But when her master saw that their hope of profit was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to the authorities. Then the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates tore off their clothes and commanded them to be beaten with rods. When they had laid many stripes on them, they threw them into prison, commanding the jailer to keep them securely. Having received such a charge, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet into stocks. But at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. Now, they've been stripped and beaten. They have sores on them, and they're in the prison singing. If they were put in prison, I don't think they had Christian prisons and bad guy prisons, right? They're in prison with bad guys. And it says, and the prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately all the doors were open, and everyone's chains were loosed. And the keeper of the prison, awaking from sleep, seeing the prison doors open, supposing the prisoners had fled, drew his sword and was about to kill himself. 
But Paul calling with a loud voice saying, do yourself no harm, we're all here. Then he called for a light, ran in, and fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. And he brought them out and said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? So they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes. And immediately he and all his family were baptized. Now when he had brought them into his house, he set food before them, and he rejoiced, having believed in God with all his household. Peter and Paul knew by the Master, by the Holy Spirit, that they would do things that Jesus had done, not just up to what Jesus had done, but what? Even greater, right? Jesus said, you will do even greater. That's what he said. You will do even greater. <coughs> so what had they seen and what did they know through the Holy Spirit that prepared them for being in prison? To not say, let, let's talk about you and I, this 25 person group of people that are murderers and were in prison, right? If you're caught doing whatever it is, if you're caught doing something, even if you think it's a worthy cause, and you're put in prison, I don't know about you. For me, I would say, shucks, I got caught. And so I would go and serve my sentence. And I would thank the rest of the people, I'll be in here praying for you. But they were like, put me in coach. <clears throat> They're just waiting to get out, right? It's, it's as if when they're in that small space, it's like that compressing, that making of gold, being in that small space, it, it purifies and makes them even more powerful. What would happen to you if you were in that kind of prison? If you had been beaten, would you just be so glad to get out that you would just go into hiding? What was it about Joseph that made him into that spiritual giant, that great leader? that saved so many people, including his family, out of the goodness of his heart. So I said that there was one nugget, this, this gold, and this is probably, I said once before, this is the longest intro into a sermon, that was the longest intro into the sermon, because here is the real gem here. Mark 5, 21. This is what they learned from Jesus. Mark 5, 21. And I hope I can get this story out in a way. I don't know how the writers of the gospel got this out in a way that it makes sense, but it does. Jesus was healing and delivering. He was like in his heyday. He was creating a huge buzz. And this was the time when he sent legion out of a man and sent the demons, legion, into 200 swine and then sent the swine into the water, into the sea. And they said, a multitude 
have gathered. We don't know what a multitude is. Have any of you been to like the Women's March, the inauguration, the 4th of July on the mall, any of those things? That would be a multitude. It's that sea of people that you can't just say, okay, everybody turn right. A multitude had gathered around Jesus. And you have, let's picture that we're a part of this multitude. They also use the word throng, and they use it as kind of a verb, like they're thronging around. And thronging, I envision, it's kind of a sound as well as kind of a jostling, thronging around, like they're touching and moving and pushing and that kind of thing. So a multitude of people, thousands, and they're thronging. So they're all saying, Jesus, Jesus, ah! So there's noise and all of this chaos. As he is traveling, Jairus, a ruler in the synagogue, this is a man, great authority, he comes and finds Jesus. And when he sees Jesus, he falls down and he begs him earnestly, saying, my little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her, that she may be healed, and she will live. He has great faith. He went through great pains just to find Jesus, just to get, if you've been at like an inauguration and you want to get to the front of the stage, good luck. Try to get to a man, right? He wanted to get to a man. Okay, so this is the plot. Jairus. Now there's going to be a subplot. And there's probably 82 plots in this throng going around Jesus. He said, you have to to get to her so she will live. So Jesus went with him. So he starts off with Jairus. And the great multitude starts to go with him. They start to follow him. And it says they thronged him. Which means they're going, Jesus, where are we going? Where are we, are we going to go to Jairus? Are we going to go to the synagogue? What are we doing? Uh, 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 uh. Okay? Now, a certain woman. And this is probably the story we think about, but it's actually a subplot. Can you tell that I was a theater major? <laughs> I, I see everything like acted out on the stage. Now, a certain woman had a flow of blood for 12 years. Think back what you were doing for 12, 12 years ago. Think what was happening 12 years You had George 12 years ago. Think if you'd had a, you had been bleeding since then. 12 years. 12 years. And had suffered many things from many physicians. She'd gone from doctor to doctor to doctor. And it says she had spent everything she had. Somehow, as weak as she was, she made it through the multitude and the thronging, and she gets to Jesus. She was ill. She had gotten no better, but she knew she had to get to him. So, remember, Jesus is following Jairus to go heal his daughter. And she's thinking, if I could just touch his clothes, I'll be well. And she does. Immediately, the word that they use, immediately the fountain of blood dries up. The fountain 
That's serious. The fountain of blood dries up. And Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that power had gone out of him, turned around in the crowd. So he's like walking with Jairus. And there's this crowd. And he says, who touched me? Now his disciples who are with him, they're like bodyguards, right? And they say, what do you mean who touched you? Everyone is touching you. That's what thronging is. And he's like, no. I felt power leave me. And, okay, plot number one, Jairus is kind of in a hurry, right? And the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what had happened to her, fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And I imagine it was not a short story, right? She had been going through a lot. And Jairus is still standing there, not wanting to be disrespectful. He understands authority. He's a ruler of the synagogue. But he is kind of like, Jesus, you're my last hope. What are we going to do? And then, and here's part of the lesson, guys. While Jesus was still speaking, these friends of Jairus from the synagogue, from the house, Jairus' house, come up to him and says, Your daughter's dead. Why trouble the teacher any longer? and try to get him to just leave Jesus alone. A, they didn't even believe who Jesus was. And they were pulling him away from his potential miracle. And that's a lesson for us. When we're going after our miracle, you need to be aware of the people who will dissuade you and pull you away from that. They called him the teacher. The teacher. Why trouble the teacher any further? Your daughter is dead. As soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, he said to the ruler of the synagogue, Do not be afraid, only believe. And he permitted no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John. Peter, the same one that he got out of prison, got to witness what happened next. When he got to Jairus' house, and I'll make this quick because I still want to celebrate communion with you guys in our little cell. Um, when he got to Jairus' house, there are mockers everywhere who will not believe your walk, who will not believe your faith. He got into the house and he said, why are you weeping? She's only asleep. Jesus said this. And they ridiculed him and laughed at Jesus. And then he put them outside. And it says in the Greek, he ejected them. I don't know if any of you watched Seinfeld years and years ago. She, does, she has the scene where she said, get out! I mean, it's, it's funny. I don't even know what the thing is about, what the story is about, but it's funny when she pushes these guys. That's what Jesus did. I mean, we think about, you know, God is like, he's a good, good father. Oh, he's so gentle. No, sometimes Jesus is gangsta. He said, get out! If you are not with us, you are against us, and you are not welcome in here. There are times if you have someone who is sick, if you have someone who is struggling, if you have someone in your little cell who is not agreeing with you, you've got to say, 
get out. It's me and Jesus in here. And that's what Jesus was doing. He said, get out. And then he took the father and the mother and those who were with him only into the child. And then he said, little girl, I say to you, rise. And she was healed. And said, give her something to eat. And she got up, right? Jairus wasn't in prison when the girl was dying because he still had somewhere to go. He had to go to Jesus. That was his way to go. But when she died, that was when he was in prison. He had nowhere to go, but he still had God in the prison with him. That's what being in prison is. When you have four walls around you and only God is in there with you. You need to activate your gifts. You need to look at your environment. And anything that is not God or your gifts, you need to say, get out. You can affect your environment. If God is in it with you, you can affect change from inside your prison. And you don't have to have some big earth-shaking experience. Your prison could be sitting in traffic. And you could just be like, oh, there's a wreck and I'm dying. I'm on 95 or 66 or any number of the roads that you can be sitting in traffic. So what do you do? Okay, I'm, I have basically, metaphorically, four walls around me. Jesus is here. Everything else, get out. I'm going to pray. I'm just going to intercede. Uh, that lady next to me, she looks really antsy. I'm going to pray for her. Look at her. And pray. It doesn't have to be huge. If you have an immigration issue, and you have those four walls, there's no way out. If God is in it with you, tell those unbelievers, get out. I don't know the way out, but God is in here with me. I'm going to pray. It doesn't matter what the situation is. If God is in it with you, pray, worship, use your gifts, and all those scoffers, Tell them to get out. So, as for me and my cellmates, we believe. Amen. Amen. So, Father, we just invite you into those prisons because we know you always have the key. You always have the key for us. And we thank you that you refine us, that you make us strong. And that you love us and will find a way out. Give us discernment to know those things that need to be ejected. Thank you for loving us that.